Hello everyone, welcome to this week's Lunch and Learn. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Scott Ward. Okay, all set Valerie? Okay, so as Valerie mentioned, my name is Scott Ward. I'm a plant ecologist at Artful Biological Station. And today I'm gonna to talk about one of my favorite groups of plants, actually my favorite group of plants, not one of them, um, sedges. Particularly, uh, I'm gonna go a little bit more in, into depth than Rincospora. For those of you who tuned into my said presentation um, in Archbold seminar series a few months back. So to review a few things, sedges are ecologically ubiquitous. They occur in almost every habitat in Florida uh, from wet to dry. Here's uh, sort of the margins of a depression marsh up in Hernando County that had lots of Rincospora pusilla. Uh, here's Tiger Creek in central Florida where you can find Rincospora gray eye. Um, and in the drier reaches, Rincospora megalocarpa. Here's a hyper-diverse calcareous prairie at Avon Park Air Force Range. Really fantastic habitat, but you can find tons of Rincospora tracei and all sorts of other interesting graminoids, um, especially in the wetter areas. Here's Carter Creek, also in central Florida, kind of a wet, wet pine savanna. Um, in the certain areas you can find just tons of sclera mulembergii and all sorts of other interesting species, especially graminoids. Here's Babcock Webb in southwest Florida, where after a burn, you can find tons of Rincospora latifolia and up to 15 or 20 species, depending on the management unit of other Rincospora. Here's my friend Lily. She's uh, next to sort of a sandbar in a spring run in the panhandle of Florida. Um, where if you're lucky, you might be able to catch the rare Rincospora canipes. Even in the floodplains along the Apalachicola, when you're distracted by beautiful shows of Pacra globella, you can also find some interesting sedges mixed in there as well. But, you know, fear not, even if you're stuck in an urban environment like St. Petersburg, you can even look in some of the sidewalk cracks and find species like Bulbostylus barbata. Even in some areas where you think you're going for some of the showy species like Saracenias, um, if you look closer and really get down, down and dirty, you can start to pick up some really interesting sedge species mixed in there as well. Just to quickly go over some basics, um, Cyperaceae is the technical family term for sedges. There's about 5,000 species worldwide across about 100 genera. Genera is just that plural form for genus. In Florida, there's probably around 300 species or so, depending on the taxonomic treatment. Um, as I mentioned, they're ubiquitous. They're extremely fire adapted. They're found in the wettest to the driest. Um, up in, all the way up to the Arctic, you can find good carex diversity. But then, of course, as you start going closer to the equator, you start to lose a little bit of that carex diversity and gain in Rincospora diversity, especially in those tropical savanna type habitats. So they differ a little bit from grasses um, in that grasses typically have round or terete stems. You'll see that term used a lot. Uh, and they have these reproductive structures that have these pair of glooms that subtend what we call florets. And those are just kind of the reproductive structures. And there can be one to many florets um, on, on, above those glooms. They're similar to rushes, but rushes typically also have terete or round stems. And they have a little different floral structure where they have these conspicuous tepals and capsules within the tepals. And then with sedges, sedges, you'll, you know, you'll hear that term a lot, sedges have edges. Um, most sedges are trigonous or three-sided with those kind of sharp edges on the side with three ranked leaves as well. But some species can actually have round stems as well, like Xenoplectus. Uh, the seeds or the achenes are often trigonous or three-sided as well, uh, but can also be biconvex, biconvex or lens-shaped, meaning they have two sides. So when you start to get down to uh, identifying Cyperaceae, there's a lot of terms that you start to come across frequently in the, in the keys and in the floristic treatments that you'll want to use. Um, some of these basic terms you're probably already familiar with, like is the species annual? Is it complete its life cycle one year? Or is it perennial? Does it have underground um, storage organs that help it to come back each year? So you can see on this top picture, um, Rincospora pusilla, very cespitose. Um, it has these underground mechanisms to keep re-sprouting each year, especially after fire. 
Or in the bottom picture, here's a species, uh, Furina scripoidea, that has these really long uh, rhizomes. So root, root structures are really important. Just grabbing like above ground uh, components of the plant is sometimes um, not enough to identify the species. Are the stems three-angled or trigonous, or are they rounded, as I mentioned earlier? When you start to get into the genus Cyparis, it's really important to understand if the scale arrangement beneath the reproductive portions, the achenes are disticus, two-ranked, or imbricate, spiral, spirally arranged. And then you'll see a lot proximal versus distal. And all that means is, is the structure they're talking about closer to the ground, proximal, or is it distal? Is it further away? Is it towards the top of the plant? You start to get into some textural differences too, like is the stem rough or scabrous, or is it glabrous, uh, which is just basically another term for smooth. And then when we start to get into the achenes, the, the, the seed structures, um, it's gonna be really important to look at these features called bristles. Some species don't have them, a lot of them do. And on these bristles, they can have these little barbs on the side. These barbs can face upward, meaning they're introsely barbed, or they can face downward towards the base of the achene, and that's called retrosely barbed. So a few terms that are really pertinent, scales, achenes, perigenia, spikelets, inflorescences. There's a number of other terms, but those are some of the main ones you're gonna see in these keys. And I'll go a little bit more into depth in these reproductive structures with some examples later on. Just a quick summary of the sedge genera in Florida. Um, some of these genera only have one species. Some of them have lots of species, like Rincospera has more than 60. So um, it's just a matter of tackling the right genus in the right manner. But some of them you're lucky in that if you find one in it, um, you know, you'll only have one species like Dilichium for, Dilichium, for example. Here's just a quick picture. I'm not gonna get into these genera today, um, but it's really important to remember that there's so much diversity in the Cyperaceae, even though they're sort of bound by a few um, a few characters. They're different in their own in their own way as well. So we have Chenoplectus, the round stemmed sedges. Um, you have species like Bulbastatus wearii, which occurs in really dry habitats. Species like Iliacris interstincta in the top left there. This is one that tends to colonize um, man-made retention ponds. So even in some of the most disturbed, sort of recently modified habitats, you can find sedges as well. And then of course, no one could forget, forget Caladium jamaicensi in the top right corner. There's a large inflorescence on sawgrass, which we call a grass, but it's not a grass. In fact, it's a sedge. This is the, one of the main species of the Everglades. So it's important to know that not only is this a sedge, but it's a really important sedge. I'm gonna really quickly go over Carex and then spend the rest of the presentation on Rincospera. So Carex are distinct from other sedges in that they typically have the pre they have these structures called perigenia. And these are basically uh, sac-like structures that surround the achenes of the seeds. And you can see in this, in this picture of Carex turgescens, here is one single perigenia and multiple would be called perigenium. So they usually, multiple perigenia will comprise a spike. There's about 75 to 80 taxa in Florida and about 2000 species worldwide. North America has over 600 species alone. So it's a really diverse genus. Um, and if you're in the peninsula, you will not see much diversity. You'll see a few species here and there. Once you start getting up into like the Northeast, it's really you know common to find maybe 150 to 200 in some of those, each state in, in the Northeast, so in temperate areas. There's numerous ways you can learn these species, but um, you know some species you, you can just see in the field and say, I know where I'm at. I know there's only a few options. This looks so distinct. It's Glaucus blue. It's gotta be Carex varicosa. Um, but other species, they are, they exist as part of these diverse groups called sections. And these are basically a way that botanists um, could organize really diverse groups into morphologically similar sections so that they're a little easier to tackle. So when you get to the keys for those sections, you don't have to start, you know, in some of the more basic traits of carrots. You can get right to the key and then you can start splitting it from there. Some of these diverse groups, even in Florida, uh, are Ovales, Laxiflori, and Grizzii. And then there's a few sections that just only have one or two species as well. So there's about 26 sections in Florida. They can be kind of overwhelming to learn at first. So sometimes it's not the best option for beginners. Um, but when you start to really get into it, it turns out to be one of the more useful tools. 
And even though Carex is much has much higher diversity in the Northeast or the temperate areas, um, or boreal areas of the of the planet, it's still very diverse and diverse in the Southeast United States, particularly in the Florida Panhandle. Um, and many species are even highly localized or quite rare. I'm just going to go through a few picks just to show you that show you the diversity of sections and morphologies. You can see the Lupulini up in the top here has these, these hop sedges. They have these really round inflated perigenia, often with these sharply trigonous achenes. Um, you have species like Hymenoclani called the green danglers that will have these kind of long drooping spikes with multiple perigenia kind of grouping downwards. And some species can look really similar like Carex debilis and Carex venusta. As I mentioned, Carex varicosa are pretty common species in the Peninsula um, has these kind of glaucous blue perigenia. There's a, two other species in this section though that can look kind of similar. Some, some species have these really cool looking perigenia called obconic shaped perigenia. Some species have much smaller perigenia that are kind of more flat, flat shaped. And then some species, as I mentioned, are quite rare like Carex thornia. It's pretty limited in sort of the panhandle area in adjacent states. So. Sometimes if you're in the right area and you're really keeping your eyes peeled, you can find some pretty interesting species. But then of course there are characters on the perigenia, like if they're if they're very woolly or hairy, that can help you to get, you know, pretty much either to the section or right to the species. So as I mentioned, I just wanted to briefly go over some of those other genera, but I'm gonna kind of hone in on Rhincospora. Um, Florida is a really good state to, to sort of delve into Rhincospora. Um, and that's because Rhincospora has a greater affinity for warmer, humid, kind of subtropical areas. So the American coastal plain is a perfect place to study this genus. There's about 60 or more taxa in Florida and about 250 worldwide. There's a lot in South America as well. Field identification, although, uh, although you can ID some in the field, it's a lot more difficult uh, compared to Carex. Magnification is really crucial when it comes down to identifying these things to species. And usually you have to look at the shape of the spikelets and uh, the shape of the achenes, the textures. These are really essential characters to identify Rhincospora species. And as I mentioned, they're found in a variety of habitats from the wettest to the driest. Just a quick map here from Bonap to show you um, Rhincospora diversity patterns. Obviously you can see the darker green colors refer to counties that have higher numbers of Rhincospora vouchers that were collected. Um, and you can see in the Gulf Coastal Plain here in the Panhandle, these darker colored counties have, you know, greater than 40 species of Rhincospora collected per county. Um, so basically from the Carolinas over to Louisiana or so, you get really great diversity as far as North America. And Bay County in particular has about 40, holds the record, at least according to, you know, some synthesis of, uh, you know, pluralistic collections at 45 species. And then this picture, I love, I love these side-by-sides. It helps you to kind of grasp the, the differences in how Rhincospora's look. Some people feel, oh, it just, they all look the same. But when you really start to delve into them a little deeper, you realize that they are quite different in a number of ways. You can see some have these showy white bracts. Some have these really long spikelets and combs that reach, you know, up to your, up to your neck or so. Others are really small and only have these small sort of diminutive spikes, spikelets as well. Some have these globose clusters. So Rhincospora can vary quite a bit just looking at it before you can get into the Akeen. Just to reiterate with some more pictures, this shows you the diversity of how Rhincospora can look uh, in the field. Some like Rhincospora pusilla have these really small inflorescences. Other have, others have these showy white um, scales surrounding the Akeens. Um, some are kind of more nondescript, like some of the plumosi, where they have these um, kind of fascicles of of brown scales surrounding the Achenes or the spikelets. So there's a lot of diversity um, and looking at, in the, looking at them in the field is really important, but once we start getting into Achene structure, you'll see why that's much more crucial to identify species. A few terms uh, that you'll see and that I'll kind of use. Um, so these bracts are these uh, modified leaf structures that will often subtend the spikelets that are often below it. Spikelets are often aggregated into these clusters um, and they'll contain one or sometimes many achenes or seeds. 
these bracts also can just kind of look like almost extensions of the stems in some ways, just kind of green and nondescript. So there are only a few species that have these really showy white um, bracts. So just a few of the common terms that you really need to know if you're going to get into ring cosper identification. Really, when it comes down to it, though, the most crucial aspect are the achenes. Um, I'm just going to show a few quick uh, illustrations from Flora North America that shows how some of these can differ. So the blue here shows, that, so this is sort of, you know, kind of a typical achene and rincospora, at least with some, with one group. And you'll see these achenes here at the base. So this would be considered the base or proximal closer portion, right? And then usually above the achene, you'll have these tubercles. And these tubercles can vary quite a bit in their shape and their length and their texture. Um, and then at the base of the achene in a number of species, not all of them, you'll have these kind of wiry structures called uh, bristles. And these bristles can have these little barbs, these little teeth on the, on the edges of them. And some barbs face upward, meaning they're inchorously barbed. Some barbs face downward, meaning the species is rhetorically barbed. Here's another species perfectly showing that rhetorically barbed character. You can see how these teeth face downward now, but also pretty good size akeen. And here's a tubercle. You'll notice that these barbs ex exceed the length of this akeen. They start here and they exceed this length, but they don't go past the tubercle. Some species, it's really important to look at the shape of the tubercle. Some of them are kind of indented on one or both sides, and that can be really diagnostic. Some species have an interesting kind of shading in the middle part of the achene compared to the outside. Sometimes the middle will be a lighter color. And you'll see in this species, these bristles don't exceed the length of the achene, and they, don't, they definitely don't exceed the length of the tubercle. So sometimes you'll see in the keys, you know, Akeen one and a half to you know three fourths times the length of the akeen. Some of them far exceed the akeen length. And then of course some species don't have any bristles at all, and are just kind of really tiny. And it really helps to have some magnification, like a hand lens or a dissecting microscope. So here's a species where you'll see no no bristles at all. So let's say you're in the field and you grab you you're in you know an interesting habitat and you grab a rincospora. As I mentioned, field identification is possible in some cases, but in most cases, you're going to have to grab some spikelets, grab some machines, and key them up from there. So what's really helpful if you're starting out and you like taking pictures, but you don't necessarily want to key things out, is at least taking close-up pictures of the inflorescence, noting the habitat, and then eventually trying to take some pictures of the achenes. So really mature reprodu reproductive stems, ones that aren't in flower, are ideal. You want that achene fully formed. So let's say you're in this habitat in central Florida. You know, it has some, uh, um, it has some tenium present, some other interesting grasses. It's pretty wet. You might be willing to call it like a seepage slope or, you know, kind of a wet savanna or so. And you see this ring cosper here. You're like, God, I have no idea what this is. You see the achenes and it has these kind of cool bristles and this little constriction here. Well, let's, let's, let's run it through the key and then just practice. And I'll show you that it can be quite easy in some cases. So this first one, so this key is taken from um, Alan Weekly's recent flora published in October, 2020. Um, in I really like his Rincospera key because it separates them into really logical groups. Um, so let's start on this first, this first split here. When you're looking at keys, especially in, in Alan's flora, you'll see numbers on the left here. And those are always the numbers you wanna start with. So even if the, the second number one was all the way down here, you're gonna to wanna to read the first one and read the second one. Don't get too confused by going down to the second one first. So always start with the, the paired numbers that are lowest. So really what this is asking us now, are the tubercles greater than three millimeters or are they less than three millimeters? Boom, really easy split at first. So let's see what it would look like if they were this long. They'd probably be within this group that has, that I like to call the giant rings. You don't even really need a hand lens in some cases. You can see that these achenes and these tubercles are super long. And this is, you know, about as long as a fingertip or, in, or longer in some cases. Um, when we talk about Rincospora, some are really tiny. So th these are sort of the opposite where they're really long. And some of these columns can get about as high as my neck or so, or sometimes even higher. So we know it's not that one, right? If we're starting from that first picture I showed you. I didn't have a sort of ruler next to it, but trust me in that they were less than three millimeters long. 
So now we, we select this one and then we'll move on to the next pair, number two. So now it's asking us, is the are the inflorescence bracts several, foliaceous, and white colored? Or are they green throughout and thinner, or kind of capillary, like the foliaceous, so sometimes a little, a little wider. But are they green or white, basically, is, is an easy way to look at that split. So if they were white, this is what they would look like. And as I mentioned, there's a small section of green cosper in Florida that have these really showy white bracts. But of course, the ones we had had these thin sort of wiry bracts, right? So we'll, we'll take that split. We're not gonna go with the first one. So we don't go to key A or key B, we move on and we see that our inflorescence bracts are green and thin. And now we have the option of are our bristles present? Plumos, are they present in plumos or are they absent? Or if they are present, are they smooth or do they have barbs? Let's take a look at our Akeem. Boom, we can see right here, these, that doesn't get much more plumotious, uh, plumose than this. Plumose basically just means it's feathery, looks like feathers, right? So yeah, we know immediately that we're gonna be in the plumosi section. If it was anchorsely barbed, it would look like this with these barbs coming up off the bristles. If it was rhetorsely barbed, it would look like this coming down. So we know we're in plumosi. We'll go to key C, we'll move down in the key. And now here are our first splits. Are spikelets born singly or a few together in loose clusters? Basically just a few spikelets at the end of those individual branches. Or are the spikelets many born in these dense clusters? Well, let's look. If it was a spikelet born in these dense clusters, it would look like this. You can see they're all aggregated in these thick little groups here. If they were singly arranged, you'd see this one single stem with the spikelet at the end. So obviously this is the species we found. We're gonna say, yeah, this is clearly one where there's only one at the end of those individual branches. They're not clustered densely like this group here. And actually both of these are in the plumosi. So you can have obviously both within the same section. So we're gonna go with that first split and we only have two options. So at this point, we're getting down to the wire. We haven't really gotten to any confusing dead ends yet. We feel pretty confident about a lot of these, these characters. So what would it look like if it was broadly elliptic versus obovoid? Well, well, let me go back here real quick. So sometimes when you have a split, you have multiple characters and it's, it's kind of like a defense in case one doesn't really make sense or if one is kind of not clear or there's some overlapping characters. So sometimes I like to look for the most obvious character within a, within a key. So all measurements aside, it says the summit of the Akeen is constricted below a collar-like flange at the base of the tubercle. Well, and then, and then the second here is longer bristles are three fourths to sometimes longer than the length of the keen. Well, if you look at the first one, it says the longer bristle, bristles are less than half as long as the akeen. So let's keep in mind the little constriction below the tubercle and the length of the bristle. Well, we can see here automatically these bristles are definitely longer than one half. They're certainly not shorter than one half. And there's this interesting little flare, this little constriction below the base of the Akeen. So it seems pretty obvious that we have Rhincospora oligantha. Unfortunately for you guys, I have pictures of Rhincospora oligantha and Galliana right next to each other. And you can see how this Akeen, sometimes this is, you know, can, you'll have some overlapping characters, but generally a little bit more elliptic than Galliana, which should be obovoid or more rounded. The tubercle has this constriction. And the bristles are either three-fourths the length of the Akeen or exceeding the length of the Akeen. And you can just see how much shorter these uh, bristles are with Rincospora galliana. Both are plumos, both are kind of feathery, but the length is really key in splitting those two out. And then what also helps is habitat. You always want to read the habitat because that's going to sometimes cinch the deal. You're kind of on the fence. Is it galliana? Is it oligantha? And then you say, well, let's, let's look. Sometimes the habitats can be really similar, but if everything is led up to you feeling confident that it's oligantha, and then you see, oh, hey, I'm kind of in a seepage area, then it's probably it, right? So once again, just kind of reviewing those two really key characters that separates these two. So once again, we start out, we see these Akeens are plumos. We're looking at spikelet characters. It helps us to get back into the Akeen characters. And then we cinch the deal with habitat. You can just see the diversity, the six species in Florida and Plumosi. You can just see 
Some of them can look pretty similar, but there's really crucial differences when you start to really dissect those characters. So there are a number of species in keys A through D, these, these four first groups, but a lot of the species are going to be in these second groups, key E and F. And I don't have time to really go too much into depth into these, but I'll just show you how some of these can kind of look, so at least you're familiar with these moving forward. But really, what this, these last two come down to are, are the bristles either absent? Are the bristles long? Or I'm sorry, are the bristles thin? And are they barbed either upward or downward? It's kind of where these last two groups fall in. And there's numerous sections within those two. So yeah, they can be kind of smooth. These have bristles or they can be rugose or what's called transversely rich sometimes, or sometimes they can look really cool like honeycomb reticulate patterns. So, you know, when you kind of look at the Akeen at first, you think some of these are important, but these, these, the surface of the Akeen, the bristle length and how they're barbed are going to end up being some of the most important characters if you're trying to identify these things. Just to show you a little more diversity within uh, a keen shape and texture within these sections, you have some species like Rincospera compressa, a really cool species of savannas and sepageries in the panhandle. Uh, it's called compressa because it has these kind of flattened Akeens, but really interesting, um, almost hat-like shape on the tubercle. Some species are pretty rare, only a few collections ever made in the peninsula, like Rix, uh, Rincospera eximia. Um, you can see some textures are similar, like Miliaceae. Um, in the mixed -y section. And then these are all three separate species within one small section globularity. So we're talking about pretty minor differences, kind of wavy versus honeycomb reticulate here. And then some are tiny, like these three, it's really hard to show because I didn't have a ruler in here, but these are just absolutely tiny. And you really need like 20X or 40X to even um, get a sense for what species they could be. And once again, they can be really subtle. So these are all four that kind of fall really close within, uh, within one part of the key. And they all kind of are bound by similar surfaces in the Akeens, but when you start to look at, oh, some are a little bit thinner, some have a longer stipe, what this little character is called here at the base of the Akeen compared to others. I mean, we're talking pretty subtle differences here. And then some kind of have a little bit more of a, you know, a, a tubercle that quickly kind of indents and then goes to a long point at the end. So really getting into some of these, really kind of getting obsessed actually is the best way to, to really figure out how to, how to learn some of these for the long run. And then I'll just show a few more pictures, kind of highlighting the really beautiful diversity of, of these Akeens. To summarize, um, there's a number of species in the Cypressae, but really the, the genus diversity is low, especially compared to grasses. So it can actually be quite palatable to learn these things. Um, general like Carex, Cyparis, Francospora, and Iliacris are really diverse. Um, so it just takes some time and patience and really just getting through those keys, being confident with your selections and learning a lot of these somewhat confusing terms at first really helps you to become, you know, a little better at learning these things. They're found in all types of habitats from the highest to the, the highest and driest to the lowest and wettest. Um, but you really have to collect in some of these reproductive parts and look at them with magnification to, to really key out some of those really important features. Um, so start with some easy species, like some of those showy ones, you know which key they're gonna come, come to already and kind of run them through and get familiar with running them through the key and then it'll, it'll be easier moving forward. There are just a few resources that I prefer to use. If you wanna know what some of these terms are, a lot of them are defined in this really great book. Um, uh, the third edition of Wonderland Hansen is great for Rincospera. Um, it's set up a little bit different than weekly, which I tend to use a little bit more of, um, but they're both, it's nice to, to key in one. And then if you're not confident, key in the other and see if it makes sense. I also like using this online resource for North America. They actually have kind of a new beta set up too. So it's really, this, the site is set up really nice now and you can look up individual species. It's all free, it's all available online. And it'll tell you really specific measurements if you want to get down to the nitty and gritty. And it shows these really nice illustrations too. Uh, I just want to acknowledge um, Archbold, specifically the Plant Ecology Program, for encouraging um, you know this this kind of outreach. Uh, Florida North America for allowing these free, really helpful resources. A bunch of botanists, especially in Florida, that have helped me to kind of 
become a lot better at sedge identification and, and field ID in some cases. Really appreciate Florida fire managers. A lot of these things aren't really evident unless there's fire. Conservationists across Florida as well. And to all of you who support Archbold and Florida Native Plant Society. There are just some sources that I use throughout. And with that, I'll take some questions. Thank you so much, Scott. Uh, Thanks, Mallory. Yeah, so uh, before we take questions, I just want to say I haven't yet, but i um, going to throw a donation to Archbold, that, you know, thanking because that's where Scott works and, you know, this presentation wouldn't be possible. So if you want us, you already remember, you're watching this presentation, so you already remember the Florida Native Plant Society. So thank you for supporting us and, you know, maybe go uh, throw a little money their way so they can do more good work like this. Um, we have a lot of questions about landscaping with sedges. I don't know how you want to field those. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll take them as they come. Okay, so Diane Goldberg would like to know if there are any short, under eight inches tall sedges good for dry areas, places she does not want to mow. Hmm, under eight inches. There, you know, there are a few. Yeah, I mean, there are some bulbous stylus that are really tiny and do well in, in dry environments. Um, bulbous stylus stenophila is one, bulbous stylus capillaris, and they're re they should, I mean, I've never tried to grow them, but I think they should be pretty easy to grow because you'll see them often on these dry sandy fire lanes that are pretty disturbed and weedy. And if they do well there, then they'd probably do okay under the auspices of someone who actually was caring for them. Um, so yeah, I'd start with that, start with that genus. Um, a lot of Rincospora can get kind of tall, especially the ones that like drier habitats like gray eye and megalocarpa, but they form these really cool lower like kind of basal rosettes too. So you could kind of just try to maintain them in that way too, but that might be a little harder. But some of them, I, you know, some of these species aren't, aren't probably cultivated, right. but you could find a pretty good seed source and, and probably grow them quite easily. Some of them are, are pretty common. Yeah, I I haven't really, I mean, I'm not like a big plant buyer because I live in an apartment, but from what I've seen, I, I haven't really seen sedges available in native nurseries. They're, it's really uncommon to find them unless they're really showy. I'm surprised like like this species, mm -hmm. um, like this group actually, Colorada and Latifolia, Rincospora. I, I mean, I feel like they'd be really easy to grow. They bring a really cool like sort of white contrast to, to they could to the landscape mm -hmm. um i don't know why they're not cultivated more but certainly i know people who have grown like carex gray eye for instance right at their downspout like because it needs it wet so whenever it rains it gets enough water and they've taken off so some and then some weird sedges too like you know my friend alex has been able to see um, Carex Cruz Corvi grow up quite well in like a greenhouse setting. So there's a lot of options. I, I just wish we, I wish we did see them a little bit more available commercially. Uh, we have a request to, to go back to the resources slide so people can write them down. So here's, here's the first, so really the, the first two, we, Allen Weekly's floor you can find on the UNC or Barium website. Uh, botanical garden. I, I could send a link if someone was really interested. You can download the one just for Florida. And then uh, obviously Wonderland Hansen. This book's pretty cheap on the far right here. Then if you want to go online for free, you can go to, you can just type in flora of North America or eflores.org and find a lot, a lot of that. Yeah, so if, if people are interested in keying out like you demonstrated earlier, they can key it out for those first two books, the Florida, the Flora of Florida, right? So that's mm -hmm. downloadable. You just go to the website and then you put your email address and then they, then you can download it, right? Yep. And then the Guide to Vascular Plants of Florida is a book that you have to buy. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then eFloras, yep. you can just go to the website and then you can see that key. Do they have keys or is it just information about individual species? Yes, they definitely have keys. You can like right here, like you, if I'm on Rincospera macro, uh -huh. but if you just go to Rincospera, if you click back on Rincospera, they'll start from the beginning with those main sections. Um, but really, 
if you download we Alan Weekly's Flora, I mean, it's just incredible and it has so many different, it has so much more information available on habitat. And so um and it's just easy. I mean, you just you can get it for free. So and you can put it on your phone. I have a PDF on my phone, whatever I'm in the field, I can just pull it out and key things out. So I would I would start with this one. And he, he's trying to make it more palatable, palatable too, and like have a mix of, you know, kind of more layman terminology, but with technical terms as well. Awesome. Um, Diane also asks if you could recommend small sedges for swales. So that would be kind of a bit wetter. Like, a, like wet swales? Yeah. Um, small sedges. I would start with, well, that one's actually pretty big. Uh, if if they're going to be out and about and looking, I would start in like depression ponds or like seasonal wetlands. Look on the margins and look for um, look for so okay so small ones. Maybe look for things like you would get kind of low if it's acidic, especially you might find some really small rhinocospers like Pusilla. Um, there's some really tiny ones like Divergens um, that they could consider using. It generally is found in like more calcareous areas or areas that have been shelled, um, like limestone shelled. You could try well, see, the problem is a lot of the carricks in the peninsula are pretty big, like you know, varicosa, lupuliformis. They're they're pretty big. So, um, yeah, I'm having trouble thinking of some really small ones. But if you were, if you if you really want to look into it, you can go to this site, Florida, North America, and go back to Cypressi and then click on carricks or whatever genus you're interested in. And it, within each species description, it'll tell you typically if the habitats are gonna be wet or in areas that we generally know are wet. And then it will tell you um, how tall the columns get or how tall the inflorescences are. So typically there is information available or like right here it says, oh, okay, less than a meter. So there is information available on how, on how tall these things will get and if they'd be appropriate. The only problem is you got to find seed source. So you got to go out, find areas where um, you, you know, find a sedge that you like in a, in a natural area and they're usually really abundant. So, you know, you can collect some seed that way and go from there. Yeah. You know, normally we have our plant profiles, our fnps.org plant profiles, but mostly for plants that are already in cultivation and cultivation yeah right. so we don't have any sort of easy recommendations for sedges on our website you could start with this one can get just a little it can take over a little bit but a really easy one that you might want to start with and it's pretty small is rincospera colorata it's really showy probably easy to grow i've never tried but it's it's i've literally seen it everywhere sometimes and it doesn't get very tall compared to latifolia so that might be a good one to start with And we're just going to keep on with the landscaping questions. The people want to sure. grow sedges. So uh, mm -hmm. Teresa Blanchard asks, any recommendation for sedges that are evergreen, especially good for birds or other winged creatures? I'm assuming butterflies and perhaps insects. Okay. Uh, and would be happy on a 0.3 acre littoral shelf um, on about a foot underwater for six months and pretty dry for the other six months. Wow. Uh, that certainly ha has narrowed down the options. Um, for birds, you know, I know some of these ring cosper are important for uh, waterfowl. I just can't tell you exactly which species, um, but I'm pretty sure some of the common ones we find, like, you know, cephalantha or microcephalo, are probably at some point consumed by some waterfowl. As far as something that gets super wet and super dry on 0.3 acres, uh, 
you could try. So I'm, I'm, I'm brainstorming in my head ones that occur in like hyper seasonal, like seasonal ponds. That might be an appropriate place to start. Um, that first picture, like way back in the beginning, actually, the, I think the very first picture was like habitat for Rincosper pusilla. And that's one that gets, can get really, really wet in the wet season and then dries out substantially in the, in the dry season. I don't know if that would be really good for waterfowl though. Um, I would maybe start with cephalantha or microcephala and then carex. I mean, I think it's important to remember that even if we're not tailoring our, our gardens to one group of wildlife, there's all sorts of other groups of organisms that are going to benefit as well. I mean, I couldn't even tell you the number of times I've seen a variety of insects and spiders that are using Rhynchospora, you know, as their webs or just kind of as their, their home. I mean, you know, I see, I'll even see crab spiders on some Rhynchospora. So some, you know, these species are really going to be important for, you know, a number of, of, of insects and other organisms, even if we don't have direct evidence of, of their use for waterfowl or birds. Um, not to mention a few other in Casper are really good for pollinators too. So, um, you know, sometimes, and sometimes there, we achieve effects of planning these things without even intending to in the first place. So, you know, incorporating some really diverse uh, native components in our gardens, I think, whether it's, you know, not just sedges or not just showy asters or different sunflowers, you know, I mean, I think to have all these combined and the, the great thing about sedges is there's always plenty of seed source. Uh, I would avoid collecting the rare ones. You can always, you can always find that information on the atlas, type it in, ooh, we're in Casper Cuprinipes. Okay, it's stay in danger, stay threatened, you know, let's Try to avoid collecting too much of these things just for our own use in our yard. Um, but there's certainly lots of them that are common and there's, there's lots of seeds out there. So once again, maybe maybe explore some of the wetlands in your in your area. Look for the ones that get really wet and you know that are really dry in the dry season. See what's see what's there, try to ID them, and then throw a few seeds in and see how they do. Yeah, this would be a great chapter project if your chapter has a nursery or is starting one, you know, to collect with fully permitted and, you know, landowner conservation land permission, you know, collect these seeds and, and grow some of these out of local ecotypes of these sedges because yeah. it's just not, it's not yeah, really that's, fair. That would be, I would love to see more of that, more of that pop up. I mean, we, we, we know we know there's a lack of native plants already in our landscaping. So why not, you know, use that initiative to incorporate some more graminoids as well. Uh, we have a good question here. We switch over to the ecology side. Eugene Kelly, our policy and legislation chair says, it's mentioned that some species are at least tolerant of fire. Are any of them fire dependent like grasses, for example, wire grass that respond favorably to fire? Oh yeah, I mean, I'm, see what I what I think would be easier is to think about sedges that don't do well with fire because I most of the perennial ones are going to do quite well and even some of the weedy sort of more annual ones still do pretty well after fire and other disturbance. Um, you know I've seen Rincosper megalocarpa and gray eye. I've seen both of those uh, resprout almost immediately after fire. Um, as far as seed bank dynamics, I don't think we quite understand that yet, or at least I don't. Um, that would be really cool to look into and figure out how that works. But even like even let's say in New York State, which we don't think of as a really fire prone state, even though historically maybe it had a little bit more even all the way up in upstate New York, close to Canada, in some of those barren habitats, they see incredible responses of, of species of carex after fire. So, you know, species that may have not been evident without it. I know there's one species, Rincospora eximia, that we found um, 
tons of actually Jay Horn found and then kind of brought me to the site. And, you know, we were having trouble finding it a few weeks ago when we went back because, you know, obviously we first found it, you know, a couple months after fire. So there might be things that really do need fire. We just, there's still a lot we need to learn. Would you say that we need to have more research on sedges? Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, sedges are so, it's such a niche group that usually the people who are researching them are, they're doing the, the systematics or the taxonomy. And we only, you know, we only know little tidbits about their, their ecology. So, you know, typically we tend to focus on the really rare ones and their, their fire ecology, like especially on the Lake Wells Ridge um, and resources for that is limited too. So, you know, it's just a matter of what, a lot of it is like, oh, what did, what did, what did you see? You know, what was the response you saw? And like, what I've seen is numerous species resprouting vigorously after fire. So there's still a lot of gaps in the knowledge, but just casually, yeah, I mean, they love it. A lot of them love it, so. Um, I know you have to go, so we are gonna, we are gonna wrap up right on time. Okay, cool. Is one good? Well, yeah, yeah, that's, I uh, think, Thanks for helping to organize this and I have tons of fun. And if there's other questions, they can post them or email or I don't think, did I put my email here? Oh, I took it out. It's S-W-A-R-D at archbold hyphen station.org. Feel free to send any particular questions. I'll try to answer them as best as I can. If not, I'll try to find the resources for them. Okay. Yeah, there's a couple more in the chat. So if, uh, if people want to, people want to ask some more, but if uh, people want to send those to Scott, that would be a good move. Okay. okay. Sounds good. All right. Thank you so much for your time and, you know, incredible amount of expertise on these sedges, which I basically know nothing about. <laughs> as long as you learn one thing today, then that's the start. So. Yeah. Okay. I'll definitely be bringing a hand lens and maybe a macro camera and, yeah, working that's out how it all weekly. Cool. Okay. Well, thanks again, Valerie. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah.